The Atlanta Story is a podcast highlighting Atlanta's most interesting creators, entrepreneurs, and builders. I'm John Birdsong with Atlanta Ventures, and in today's episode, we have Jeff Graham of Guild Quality. During his early career in residential development, Jeff found a niche service surveying home buyers and their customer experiences with contractors. In 2002, he started Guild Quality, a software company making the manual process much more simple and scalable. Since then, he righted the company through the Great Recession, built the business to over 50 people, and recently sold it to Providence Capital. Graham is already on to his next businesses, which we cover in depth. After listening to today's podcast, we're confident you'll be keeping your eyes and ears open to problems ready to solve around you. We hope you enjoy the show and subscribe to The Atlanta Story. Jeff Graham, welcome to The Atlanta Story. Really appreciate your time. Thanks so much for being here. John, delighted to be with you. You know, over the next 30 to 40 minutes, want to get to a lot of things, particularly around building and ways that that you've you know navigated your career and built a substantial business. Before we get to a lot of that, just just talk to us how how you're doing during the coronavirus and give us just a, a quick temperature check. Um, I, I am feeling incredibly fortunate and grateful. Uh, my loved ones are healthy. Um, my business timing um, with the exit of my last business seems like incredibly, you know, yeah, you, 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 had some pretty good, you had some pretty good yeah. timing on that. Uh, yeah, yeah. And, uh, and have been, you know, have a puppy and have been spending a lot of time with them. My heart, I'm really, I'm, I'm sure like you, my heart is really heavy for, for Atlanta right now yeah. and, uh, in the country more broadly. But, uh, you know, we love, we both love Atlanta. So we're, uh, we're sad or I'm sad. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. No, um, glad you shared that. Can you talk to us about your formative years, just, just growing up? and how you got to Atlanta, what, what prompted you to become an entrepreneur? Sure. Yeah. Um, I came to Atlanta via Northside Hospital in 1973. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> got here, really started my life here very early. Yeah. Um, and uh, both, neither of my parents are from Atlanta. My mother's uh, it's from the, the North Georgia mountains and my father's from Rock Hill, South Carolina. They were, you know, probably kind of among the first in either of their families to come to the big city. They moved here for Emory and, uh, and they stayed here. Um, and Bill, they moved away a little bit to Louisiana, but for the most part, the four kids in my family are all, you know, from Atlanta and grew up here. I'm the youngest of four. Um, Entrepreneurship for me was, I think for a lot of people, it's an unusual path. Um, for me, it was a very normal path. My father um, is an entrepreneur and, uh, and just growing up, it was always something that was available to you. You know, I would have little businesses as a kid and, you know, and, and the, a lot of the major figures in my life were entrepreneurs. So it was a natural path. He, he started his career interesting, interestingly and, in, and software way back <laughs> when and wow. uh, and then moved into um real estate development and i was a bit opposite of that yeah. what was the emory connection in terms of moving to atlanta they um my my mom my mother is or was from blairsville georgia and she came to emory university for college Got it. and uh, she actually started at emory at oxford way back mm -hmm. when and then transferred here. And then my dad um, began college at Clemson. He's from South Carolina and, uh, and really disliked it and had, a, had some sort of scholarship. I can't remember how. And, uh, and came to Emory. They met here, Got it. you know, and so that was the start. Yeah. So that was, uh, see my, my dad turned 79 in a, a week or so. So, you know, yeah, 
a long time ago. When did you get the entrepreneurship bug? Um, it was honestly, it was not a, it was a thing since childhood. Well, I don't think it's all that unusual. A lot of kids have businesses of their own. Um, mm-hmm. I remember very early on with my, one of my brothers, um, us collecting pecans from my grandmom's pecan tree and bringing them down and shelling them, <laughs> selling them around the neighborhood bagged. Uh, when I was in school, I would, you know, a buddy of mine and I would, we'd go door to door and, uh, and the dorms and pre-sell warm donuts to be delivered to your door. First thing Saturday morning. Yep. So we'd get up. That was in know, Davidson, four. right? Yeah, I went Davidson? to Davidson College. That's right. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and then, uh, I worked, I, I'd never worked for a large company before. I'd had, I'd worked for little, small companies where I had a direct, uh, you know, was, was reporting directly to the, the owner founder and had a rapport with them. I was fortunate to have some outstanding, uh, mentors, both within my family and, and early bosses in my career. So it was just never an unusual thing. And then I worked for a home builder in Beaufort, South Carolina, uh, building homes, a very small boutique. I, I worked through high school, you know, construction jobs sure. uh, as a framer, carpenter, carpenter's assistant, really. And, 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 uh, and then after school, I got a job with a home builder and was building homes and did that for two years and then joined my father and brother in the development of a, a large community in Charleston, South Carolina. Okay. We're, our development company is a boutique development company, really small little one, but it was doing a, a big project, probably, you know, people thought we were ambitious. We were ambitious um, to build something at scale, given how small we were. But uh, and this is early two thousands, late nineties. This is nineteen ninety seven, ninety eight. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I finished college in ninety five. Worked with a home builder for a couple of years. Came up from Beaufort to Charleston uh, to help develop ion and Mount Pleasant right across the river from Charleston. Mm-hmm. And, um, that was a great experience. And then while there, I, I got real interested in sort of how to promote, foster, create a culture of quality within your organization and, uh, and, and built some processes for us as a real estate developer and for the home builders we worked with. And then kind of felt how like is- there's a market for that. How does a, and, and not, not to get too far ahead, but how does a, someone who's building houses, how do they teach themselves software, you know, the industry of uh, the mind frame of, hey, I'm building houses, I'm working with my hands all day, every day to now staring at a screen? Yeah. Um, I mean, probably since the time I was 21 or 22, I was not really you know, carrying a bag and, and, you know, and a hammer, but, uh, but was mainly a real estate developer or a, or a builder is generally a bit of an orchestra, orchestra conductor. And the language of construction and real estate development, particularly with design, architecture, the process is, is actually astonishingly similar to building software. Um, but I was, you know, as a real estate developer, I understood how everything went together, but I was not an expert in anything other than probably I was reasonably good at framing houses, but that was about it. And as a real estate developer, like I couldn't, you know, build a storm sewer system or, 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 uh, or, you know, or put in a water system or install street lamps or anything. You just kind of, you become a generalist. And no one ever told me that you couldn't start a software company unless you were a software engineer. So I did, I wasn't aware of that. And so I started a software company, um, and approached it in a similar way as that of a real estate developer. Walk us through the time allocation change from real estate developer to software company CEO. Where is that kernel of? of, of truth around guild quality. Right. 
that said, I'm going to go do this? Uh, well, probably around 1999, I started. So Guild Quality is a software company I launched in 2002 and grew uh, until or through 2018. Sold that to a private equity company, stayed on uh, in a leadership role until very early last year, and then uh, and then left to kind of pursue my own things again. Um, but in probably around '99, we started monitoring customer satisfaction among our home buyers in the neighborhood that we're that we were building, and I built a process around that, um, trying to get an objective understanding of how well we were serving our customers. This was really early on in the whole idea of customer surveying. Things have changed a good bit since then. Um, and built a pretty robust, I mean, we had about 100 buyers a year um, and working with 10 different home builders who were building within the neighborhood. So I had sort of this, these beta testers, so to speak, and it was before we had built any software around it. So I was able to build a process for that and did that for a couple years. And then I was like, there's a business in here. I'd started doing my checking online, you know, and this was this was when the internet was new. I think I don't know that you were born yet, but <laughs> um, so I'd made my first purchase on eBay, and you know it was it was like oh, you know there's software as a service was not a term yet. Mm-hmm. I don't think Salesforce was maybe just starting, and uh, and it, I could see that there was a way to scale this process we built for the neighborhood we were developing and the builders we were working with to, to work anywhere and uh, and use software or use the internet as- Can you describe software. that process for us? What was that yeah. manual process? So uh, so really large home builders, the really the biggest companies out there, and you probably know their names, like Pulte Homes or, or Beezer or whatever, like really big publicly traded companies. They tended to have a process internally to monitor customer satisfaction. They were operating at such a scale that they needed their own process. So they would survey their buyers after a closing or after a contract or whatever and get feedback from them, and type it into a spreadsheet and then produce reports once a quarter. And often they'd pay consultants to do that. Um, and we were not a big builder, but 100 closings a year is, is big. So we were a real estate developer developing the land, selling the lots to buyers. Builders were then building the houses for the buyers that were custom homes and semi-custom homes and sometimes spec homes. And in our ability, we had 762 home sites in the neighborhood to to develop and sell. And my dad liked to say that uh, that our goal is not to sell the next lot; it is to sell the last lot. And so our all, the bulk of our buyers were coming via referral um, and. And for us to preserve the, the brand integrity we had, we needed to have uh, home buyers who really loved the neighborhood, who loved their building experience, all those sorts of things. And so I started surveying, acting kind of as if a, I was, we were a big home builder like Pulte or something and surveying all the buyers and packaging up that feedback and giving it to the individual home builders. And this was, you know, 99 or so. Right. And, uh, were you then, manually were you manually calling them yeah, up? Yeah. So I mean, I probably did the first few calls to make sure it worked, and then I then I hired, you know, at an hourly rate, a uh, a, a friend of mine's wife who was a stay at home mom and sort of working her way back into the workforce, and she did it, you know, working from home. And this was before Google Docs, so like she would fill out a spreadsheet and she would email it to me every day. And I would add more, you know, closing stuff or send it back to her. And she would do that every day. It wasn't a huge volume, but, you know, you sure. didn't have, wasn't much. Um, and then once a quarter, I would, you know, package up all that information and distribute it to all the builders and say, here's how you're performing. Here's how you're performing relative to everyone else. And the feedback from them was so enthusiastic. It was like, this is awesome. We've never seen this sort of thing before. And this is at a time builders are real competitive there and creative. But they have no real way to measure sort of aside from is their company profitable to measure right. whether or not they're really fulfilling that reason they got into the business. Like, am I doing great stuff? And so we, with Guild Quality, we gave them a language for that, like something that they could look to and use as a measurement. 
when when you hired the first team member, you know your your friend's wife, mm-hmm. had you had already known that this was going to be a business that you would start off start on the side no. while uh-uh. while you're building? No, is, I didn't. I stayed uh, in a in a management role at Ion for uh, a couple three years after that, but it became it was very quick. As soon like as as soon as I packaged up the first information and and shared it with the the team of builders, the individual companies we were working with, were it was an able- aha moment. Yeah, they were like, and I was like, oh well, there's you know, hundred thousand companies like this all over the country that they would probably like this. And, uh, and so then I started thinking about making it a business. When, when you found that aha moment, did you know what guild quality or if there was even a name yet, what it would turn into? I mean, you know, exit to the I private had a vision equity for firm. it. No, I, I mean, I was not really, I guess I wasn't, this was, I started seriously thinking about it around the time of the, the dot com bubble bursting. Um, but my view from the beginning is that was that, you know, everything's for sale, except my dog. And if we create something of great value, then someone might want to buy it. But the goal was to build a profitable, robust business. And early on, when I was looking to, to fund growth rather than via customer revenue, but with investors and talking to people, honestly, mostly fruitless conversations, I would share that we wanted to build a profitable business. And that was an immediate turnoff, like immediate right. turnoff to prospective investors. Um, this was 2002, right? 2002, 2003? Yeah, I mean, I launched it with my own money and a fraternity brother invested as well. And we got to the point where we had a real product up with real customers. And then I raised some more friends and family money. Um, and then, uh, and so that was really kind of 2003 was really when I turned the bulk of my attention to this business. And then we kind of got to about like by the time of the recession, the home building industry felt it earlier than everyone else kind of, Mid 2007, we knew something was about to be different, but we were at like 850,000 in revenue, break even. And, uh, and, you know, six employees, something like that. Right. We'd had how more you, and we'd had to let people go. How did you package up the, the pricing and how, how do you view pricing in a world that is right then hadn't really? experience this this type of service yeah that's such a great question um we were we were like wandering around in the dark um initially did terrible pricing but i mean pricing was not an impediment to the sales process early on for us which was probably should have been a good signal to me um our bigger impediment was not uh not people appreciating the value of the service it was uh it was getting in front of enough getting in front of a probably a a laggard segment of the technology adoption life cycle group like people that were not yet really adopting technology to, right. to grow their businesses and operating kind of old school um but we sold it was if you remember early on a lot of email marketing platforms uh you could you could prepay for the number of emails you were going to send and you would just prepay for that number. That's how we pretty much conducted it for guild quality surveying. So we actually ended up building up this giant unearned revenue liability that we had to work off over the years. That was a terrible way to price it. We moved to a monthly fee with recurring revenue, like true recurring revenue in 2007, I think from there. And then, that pricing turned into more or less the pricing that the business still has today. How did you communicate with, with buyers who, you know, back in 2007 may or may not even had, I mean, almost none, none of us had a smartphone, right? iPhone came out in 08. How did they, how did you communicate the value prop 
and this brand new offering to people who are building houses. Yeah, they're small business owners. You know, they're small business owners really with the their worldview is around creating real tangible things, you know, to, with interpersonal relationships and directing people who are working with their hands. So um, early on, it was very much direct sales. Like, uh, and I could talk about beachheads sometimes. I don't know if you've read the book. Uh, I think Jeffrey Lewis is the author, Crossing the Chasm. I'm not sure that's his yes. name. It's Jeff with a G. Yeah. Correctly spelled. Um, but uh, he talks about finding your beachhead. And immediately, I had a pretty robust network of small business owner, home builder, and remodelers. And, you know, in our first 20 customers, our first 20 guild members, we call them, were, uh, were probably within my network or one degree out of it. And, uh, but then after we got to that point, we needed to figure out what the beachhead was going to be. It was definitely direct sales. We were calling on people. We were not yet at the point having people coming to us. And, uh, and so the, the thing that we ultimately settled on was, and this was in the, you know, just probably right, we became a real business during the recession. So this was right at the beginning of the recession. And we're like, who wants to buy this product? It is. And, and what's a real business to you, Jeff, real quick? There were, uh, there were a lot of people making money in 2005 or 2006, but they didn't have real businesses. Like those businesses were not robust. They did not, they, they, there was so much demand to buy things, including technology. Um, that you could have a business and be perceived as successful, um, but not really be truly running the business and operating it um, in a in a way. I mean, I, and we were not, I would say we were not. We had invested in the external aspects of the company, the, the product, I should say, and making it work for people. But we had not built a business um, organizationally, culturally, uh, that could... Um, that could survive something like the recession. We had to we had to move very quickly and and grow new muscles and buy new organs and things like that to operate. Um, so you guys become a, a real business during the recession. Yeah, yeah. The, so the beachhead for us was early on. It, we looked at the existing customers, like, okay, who's buying? Who's who's signing up for Guild Quality? And they were companies that. Um, that look to be look to invest in technology to improve their businesses. And back then, that meant that they had a a decent website, um, decent website, and they were in a ge geographic location where we already had some existing customers, so there was referenceability, and they were often a part of a network that one of our members was a part of. So. Small business owners, as you like all kinds of businesses, they join networks, you know, whether it's mm -hmm. a home builders association or EO. Or EO. EO is a perfect example. So if that company was, you know, hit maybe two of those three categories, they were very likely to sign up for Guild Quality. One, they were worth a call. All three, they were almost guaranteed to sign up if we reached out to them and had a good conversation with them. So early on, it was direct sales to a highly curated target market. And, uh, and that got us probably to a couple hundred guild members, maybe 2 million in revenue. And then at that point, um, we had to start figuring out new ways to grow. Um, right. And that led into more true marketing and business development started then. And we're going to take a quick break here and share that this podcast is brought to you by Atlanta Ventures. If you are looking to start the next $300 million business out of Atlanta, check out the studio at atlantaventures.com. As an entrepreneur, people are always going back and forth on whether to raise capital, whether to bootstrap, whether to raise capital, whether to bootstrap. Talk to us about your internal dialogue over those years of let's go raise more money or let's go raise money. 
outside of, mm-hmm. you know, a, an institutional round versus no, let's continue to just have our customers feel the growth. Um, I mean, we, our story was one of necessity, really. Like I, I would have, uh, I would have taken institutional investment had it been available to us in the early years. It was, it was very available to us in the later years. And we, we passed on that. Um, but, uh, I would have taken it had it been available and I was you know, less experienced with the whole process, but at a certain point in, it was, you know, in 2008 or so, when we were still going around trying to raise money and talking to outstanding investors, I just realized that if I took that same amount of time and dedicated it solely to getting customers, then I, you know, could have a lot more customers. And so we, we turned and took that direction. We were not, we had a product, you know, we we came to market and had a product that we were selling for probably you know under a hundred thousand dollars and wow. uh and so and it was not a very good pro- i mean it was it was, it was not a bug free product but it, right. it, it was it was serviceable and back in those days like if it remotely worked people thought it was amazing um so uh so you know if you can do that and you can begin getting a lot of customers that way then the the customer revenue is far more valuable than the the investor faith or I, you know and, and now we're in a different world where you have out i think now investors are far more sophisticated and the best ones are bringing a great deal more value to the company than the money because the money i, I don't know what's going to happen right now like, like who knows what's going to happen with the market but at least prior to this you know, coronavirus stuff the money was very available and so it right. was, you, needed, um, you needed something more from an investor when did you start finding that repeatable customer uh acquisition model it was in you know after it, it stopped feeling like trench warfare to get every customer um once we developed in in 2000 i want to say 10 um i convinced a guy i met mark miles to join the company um as our coo the title wasn't really representative of what he was working on but he had robust business development experience in a uh, in a vertical specific software solution on developing channel partner networks for another mm-hmm. business in atlanta and he joined the team at, right as we were beginning to have relationships with channel partners. These are building product manufacturers or consultants who have a network of people who fit our target market profile. Right. And a big turning point for us was him taking the early work we did and figuring out how to serve both a channel partner and help them increase the value they're offering while simultaneously creating value for all those uh, contractors in their network. He took that and formalized it into uh, a real channel partner program. And so our early channel partners, these are brands that you probably would know. I'll say some of the ones you probably would know, but if you're in construction, you would definitely know them. Like Kohler, Hello Windows, James Hardy. These are big building product manufacturers. And there are a lot, there are actually a lot of them that you would never have heard of that were great for us. But, uh, but they all have preferred contractor networks. These are tend to be really great businesses that because they're building product manufacturers and so far removed from serving the customer, they want to have a direct relationship with the contractor. And so they create these networks that tend to be of sort of exceptional prospects. And we built a process to, we, 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 expanded our offering to provide the channel partner with visibility into all the customer feedback of all the contractors in their network. And so the channel partners would underwrite a portion of the service to introduce it to the, to the contractor. And then the contractor would get a taste of it introduced by the building project manufacturer and sign right up. Um, right. Cause it was, they loved it. Um, that was the point where we went from, I mean, literally, you know, going out in the forest and digging holes, trying to find treasure, or turning over rocks in a creek or something to uh, to having 
you know, real leads and real prospects coming our way. You know, the, the, that sort of part, those partnership stories are always fascinating, particularly in the SaaS world, because so much of SaaS and, and, and selling software is just picking up the phone, making X number of calls. Mm -hmm. Y'all were still doing that simultaneously. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, by, by the time we got our channel partner program really up and running and mature, um, I would say that 50% of our new business would come via the channel, channel partners would originate wow. that way. Maybe 30% of our new business would come via organic inbounds, people signing up for a free trial. And then 20% via, you know, direct or direct say, inside sales people, us cr building a list and inside sales people, um, turning that into a, to an opportunity. Talk to us about culture at Guild Quality. I've, I've, I've known several people that have worked at Guild Quality and they have all speak very highly of the culture that, that you and Mark built. What are some key lessons that you can share with, with listeners? Um, for us, again, it was, we became a real business during the recession and figured out who we were. And, uh, and the, the culture that I think pe when people are talking about Guild Quality's culture and, and during that period where we got big enough to qualify for the, you know, the best place to work things in Atlanta, um, I think was maybe over 15 employees. We were consistently ranked. We were on that list every year. Um, but the thing people would talk about is empowerment. Um, that's, uh, we were very early on in fully embracing a, uh, I call it an empowered work environment. Some people call it results only work environment, but it was, we, um, we, people could effectively do whatever they wanted. And we tried to have measurements of contribution to the business. Um, be not about your time in the office or your geographic location, but your impact. And so we spent a lot of time focusing on that. And so we ended up with a lot of people who work remotely. So we ended up building communication systems and, uh, and, uh, key performance indicators around things that you could not see by being physical. Um, physically present with someone probably probably very timely today with uh with COVID-19 yeah it has been astonishing to me that it uh, it that, that is going to be one of the enormous innovations that are an enormous kind of opening in the floodgate to open up a whole bunch of innovation and opportunity by taking geography out of the equation for a bunch of businesses for who they can hire and how they can grow and whatever I'm really excited for that I'm astonished that it's taken something like this to get there because you used to be weird if you had, a, you know, a remote workforce. But our view on empowerment was not just about like remote and you could work from where you want or whatever. Um, it was really the, the, we got to the point where I would call it maybe radical trust. Like we had a lengthy interview process and which hurt us a lot in getting great candidates. But the moment we hired you, we trusted you. Like that was it. It was not, you did not. I would joke with people, sort of joke with them that if you ever asked me for permission, I would fire you. Um, I was delighted to give advice, share my experiences, whatever. But when you're on the team, you are trusted and empowered to do whatever you think is the right thing to do. And, uh, and so that empowerment was a core part of our culture. Um, beginning around 2007, 2008, we really institutionalized it and grew it and invested in it. And the bigger we got, I think when we sold the business, we were maybe around 50 employees. And by the time I left, we were through some acquisitions, we were over 100. Um, it took an enormous amount of work to keep that value sort of mm -hmm. entrenched in everybody because because managers would get to the point they come from another company and, you know, distrust was not like a big part of that company and you import all these other attributes. And so we had to work very hard and we made some bad hires and mistakes along the way too. But um, we had to work very hard to 
keep that top of mind trust and empowerment top of mind for our team. You know, Jeff, you've, you've been a, a great thinker on, on many aspects, including, you know, the results only work environment and, and definitely a, a leader in that. You also were one of the first, first businesses kind of in the Otley area of Atlanta, yeah. Yeah. which, uh, which was, you know, at the time a little, uh, unorthodox, right? I mean, there was a little infrastructure down there. How did you, how did you view office space and, and really moving the company to somewhere that was, you saw the puck where the puck was going, but it still took a, a large leap of faith. Um, you know, we, in the same way that we would have at requisite attributes for hires, people we would hire, um, regardless of the position, we had some requisite attributes for office space, and uh, and really maybe half or two thirds of the team liked to come into the office every day. Um, so we were in the one part trying to work to accommodate them, but I would be lying to you if I didn't list uh, dog friendly as among the the top requirements for the office space, like. You know, I especially love dogs and our dog and you know, Luna, the co-founder of Guild Quality is no longer with us, but we have, a, we have Daisy now. But <laughs> I needed an office space that could accommodate that. Um, we're relatively fit crowd, so we wanted a shower in the building. We had all these attributes. It was right by the belt line. Yep. Um, I had met and got to know the the original developers there, Parkside Partners, who were active in Atlanta and doing outstanding infill redevelopment work here. I think they're great real estate developer contributors to what Atlanta is becoming. Um, and it felt good. And it was also close to home. Like, I, I'm, I'm not interested in a lot of commuting. So it was walkable for me. Um, that's what drove it. And it ended up being, you know, a lot of other people liked it. We got a great deal. And I... And I, those Parkside, was, were, they were great people to work with there. Flipping back to Guild Quality, when did you know that it was the right time to sell to Providence Capital? Um, yeah, so we had maybe two or three years before we had gotten, begun to get bombarded with growth equity interest. You know, we kind of gotten on the radar screen for we probably at like four million then, I think, maybe three and a half. Um, and we'd gotten on the radar screen of kind of institutional type investors from from growth, mainly growth growth equity at that point, but then mid institutional folks later, and had gone through a process of evaluating, um, you know, evaluating whether or not that was a right path for us. And uh, and talked to talk, ended up speaking really seriously with a great group, um, and ended up passing. We kind of got to the term sheet level and ended up passing on that because it just didn't feel like the risk parity was right. We felt like we were it was growth equity, so we were going to be taking I think like nine million dollars maybe some part for for recap and some part for growth and the rest for growth, a smaller part for recap. Um, and it and it felt like the goalpost moved so far for the business and taking that, the, the, the risk to, uh, to us, the owners, was just probably not too much. And we felt like we could do it on our own. Mm -hmm. um, this was 2016, 2016? That feels right, yeah, maybe 15, 15 or 16. Um, and then, uh, and we were real transparent with the company about this. Like, hey, we're thinking about doing this and people are kind of getting excited because, you know, in Atlanta or everywhere, they don't celebrate you getting your thousandth customer, or your two thousandth customer, or your, <laughs> your five millionth dollar yeah. of net, net operating income. They celebrate raising money. <laughs> and so, uh, so that's, you know, that's an entirely different topic about what are the actual milestones we should celebrate. But, um, but anyway, the team was kind of getting excited. We ended up passing, and I think people were kind of disappointed at that. But we had gotten sort of interest was coming. And so 
strategic invest that also led to some conversations with strategic investors that sort of bubbled along for a couple of years strategic acquirers and uh and in the december before we sold one of our longtime strategic partners who was part of our channel partner program uh who was owned by a private equity firm they said hey we're getting acquisitive and we put we we told these guys that y'all should be at the top of the list we had a conversation with them while we were having that conversation a, a bay area high flyer that's that's generally in our space you know approach us again through the channel partner network they were interested in having access to our contractors and also introducing guild quality to theirs and in that conversation they expressed real interest and say hey if you're ever interested in selling you're the kind of company we would like to buy and so then we had two strategic partners who were like we're interested right and uh and so we had started those conversations in earnest and where they were going through due, due diligence about guild quality and uh and at that time a third came to the table and again i'd said everything's for sale set my dog so if someone calls up and it's a legitimate and qualified buyer who wanted to mm -hmm. buy the business i would have that conversation and then at that time while we had two parties at the table uh a third showed up and um and they were building a platform to serve um, small businesses, Outer Commerce is the name of the platform. Now they were acquiring companies like ours. They had a, they were angular towards the home improvement industry. That was a big deal for them. So our customer base fit what they were doing. And they were just clearly far more adept at the acquisition process. Like our confidence level that they could do something was very high. Right. And, uh, and I was like, we have three interested parties at the table who've all approached us at the same time. They're all putting uh, values that are out there that seem, you know, like things that we would accept. I didn't know how long this economic, you know, mach machine could keep cranking. I was kind of feeling like we were on the cusp of another recession. And uh, and my spreadsheet of business ideas is, was getting longer and longer every day. Um, the company was in a great position. It was at a point where it no longer needed me to operate. Um, I was mostly working on things that created value six months or a year down the road rather than a week down the road. And uh, and it just felt like a time, you know, we felt like we had a window of time. And, um, right. and so we took it. It was a great experience too. I, I'd say that the, the selling of the business was one, going through that due diligence process getting to understand how private equity worked and then selling, but then also uh, working with the company under sort of the new leadership, learning how that worked and then helping them to acquire new businesses and bring it into the platform. It was outstanding experience, but it was, uh, it was time for me to return to my own things. So let's talk about your, your own things. You've got, uh, you're, you've always got amazing, um, interest in ideas, whether it's bird watching or, you know, <laughs> e education, you, you alluded earlier to a way to, to really quantify input for remote workers and quantify, uh, ways that they're accelerating the business and, and being empowered. What are some of the businesses that you want to start? What are the, some, some of the businesses you are starting? Give us just a primer of what's next. Yeah, sure. I have too many little ventures underway. I actually feel like I'm spread maybe a little bit too thin on them. But uh, the started in Mark Miles and I, who we work together at Guild Quality, um, have together started Levos, L-E-V-V-O-S, Levos.com. It's an employee engagement platform for small businesses. We we're productizing the systems we used at Guild Quality to um, to cultivate and highly engaged uh, a culture of highly engaged employees. Um, that product is under development. The uh, we've we've outsourced development of that to the Black Airplane folks. Their shop in Woodstock, really great yeah. people. Um, and uh, and we are in the QA process for that. I ambitiously would like to say that we'll have a product sort of out there in the wild very soon. 
Um, and I'm excited about that business for a bunch of reasons. Just culturally, I think small businesses need tools to help them. Uh, they, they love tools to help them be competitive, especially to bigger companies. And we're taking things that uh, systems that are available to big companies um, with really large workforces and and simplifying them and, and removing the complexity and making them work really well for that business who the owner of the company is also the de facto HR director um, and pricing it in a way that'll be really compelling. So I'm excited about that business. Uh, that one will have a bit of a similar origin story to Guild Quality, how we've gotten it off the ground. Sort of once it's a real thing, we'll internalize product development, we'll, you know, we'll push it ahead that way. Um, also started building a mountain lodge in the North Carolina mountains near Cashers and Highlands, North Carolina. It'll be a membership club. Um, the idea is to provide an easy place for people to go enjoy all the wonderful things that the mountains have to offer in a gracious, but simple and not decadent and convivial environment. So, uh, there'll be several cottages. It's beautiful property high up in the mountains, beautiful pasture, apple orchard. Um, we'll own a boat on the nearby lake and uh, and people can enjoy that. That's called Big Ridge. Um, that's the other, those are the two big things I'm working on. And then uh, and How then there's a handful of others. Big Ridge. We've completed the first little cottage. Uh, the, uh, the, the COVID stuff um, squirreled our financing. I was going to finance all the construction of the project with kind of conventional development financing with a bank and and with the stimulus things and the uncertainty. They're like no new projects at all. So I've shifted gears on that and I'm going to develop more incrementally and do that out of pocket. So it'll be kind of one cottage at a time rather than six yep. or so. But we have one little cottage that's up there um, and uh, in or an aim to break ground on the next one in July, maybe. So you've been spending a lot of time up up there. Yeah, I love it up there. It's uh, two, I mean, I'm, I meet people from Atlanta. I don't even understand this. It's two and a half hours away. And the Cashers Highlands area is like, you know, 3,500, 4,000 feet above sea level. The temperature is 12 degrees lower. It's like, it's another world. It's just beautiful. And these people will travel all over the world to go experience something like that. They don't realize we have this in our backyard. Um, yeah, I love it. So, and you, I know you, you love that area too. You got married. Well, there. Yeah, yep. Absolutely. Love it. I'm, I'm wondering if you're seeing a trend of, of people leaving cities and just moving to the mountains or, you know, a yeah. lake for good, knowing the remote work world is, have you seen any, yeah. any trends anecdotally? I know interest in Big Ridge is sort of amplified and we've actually kind of changed a little bit of the redesigning to accommodate this and initially it was going to be like work was like not something we would put any emphasis on in the design of our facilities but yeah there'll be zoom rooms and all the cottages now like it'll be a place where you can go up and enjoy that i think uh i think cities with great urbanism and affordable housing stock and a great culture are going to be very do awesome. I think that secondary markets um, like a Greenville, like Chattanooga, like Birmingham, I think they're going to do great. And I also think like, you know, rural remote work is, I mean, it's going to be very available. So, uh, so I think those places are going to do, do well. I, I, I think the suburbs are probably going to suffer, but I've mm. felt that way for a long time. Right. Well, Jeff, I want to thank you for being on the Atlanta story. And before we, uh, we, we wrap up this interview, just two more quick questions. Why Atlanta and what has Atlanta done for you? Man, uh, I love Atlanta. I really do. And it is to me like this wonderful combination of all that is great about the South um, and all that is great about a vibrant city. The city's trajectory is outstanding and it's been great to be a part of it. I grew up here. The city's so different than it was when I was a kid. Um, 
but uh, I'm, this is, you know, the capital of the South, the capital of the New South. And it's, uh, I, I just, when we looked at, I, I started the business in Charleston. And when we were looking at places to move, we looked at New York and we looked at the Bay Area and looked at Austin too at the time. I'm like, why wouldn't we be in Atlanta? Um, and so I'm thrilled to be here. In terms of what it's done for me, the community in Atlanta is, uh, is so wonderful. Like, I mean, you, uh, the, your, your um, colleagues at Atlanta Ventures, um, and prior to all of that, there's just this community of great support and encouragement that is here for entrepreneurs. And, uh, and everybody has, you know, we just tend to have this aspirational mindset, you know, want to help. So I've had enormous help from fellow entrepreneurs and people who've been down the road before. And no one's ever said no. It's so wonderful. Yeah. Like no one has ever said no. Um, so it's a, uh, it's a great place to be a part of. Well, Jeff, thank you so much for your time today and being part of the Atlanta story. Thank you, John. This podcast is brought to you by Atlanta Ventures. It was co-produced by JC Lucas and John Birdsong. If you are looking to start the next $300 million business in Atlanta, check out the studio at atlantaventures.com and the companies we work with who've done it before. Thank you for listening to this episode. If you enjoyed it, please share it at your next coffee meeting or dinner greeting, rate it, and write a benevolent, eloquent review.